On this episode of China Unscripted, China's unrestricted warfare in the U.S. and the success of Chinese and Soviet ideological subversion. Welcome to China Unscripted. I'm Chris Chapel. I'm Shelley Zhang, and I'm Matt Ganesta. And joining us today is Joshua Philip, not Joshua Philip the murderer. Joshua Philip, the award-winning senior investigative reporter at the Epic Times and host of the new show Crossroads. Welcome back, Josh. Yeah, real pleasure being here. Thanks. Yeah, so we had a pretty crazy podcast with you last time uh, you were on. We we talked about the origins of communism, I believe. Yes, quite a messy origin story. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, so I think before we get into that, uh, we're going to all have a little bit of tea from our tea sponsor, Path of Cha. So tonight we're drinking, uh, it's called Ya Shir Xian, which I will sort of censor the translation, but in English it means the fragrant aroma of duck poop. I mean, that's a very poetic translation for Xian. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, isn't it sure? Or xiang, yeah. Xiang shi is poop. Yeah. yeah. It well, does, it's not, it's poop. You can say poop. I can say poop. Um, so, yeah, have a sip, guys, and then I'll, I'll tell you all about this tea. This is nice because we usually don't have guests on for the tea. What do you think, Josh? It's nice. Almost like um, like a hint of orange or something. Yeah, it's it's got a really complex flavor. How yeah, about that, you, That's man? the poop, Chris. That's the poop. <laughs> Shelly? I like it. What's it's the very... poop on the poop? Okay, so is this like civet cat coffee where it's... No, not at all. Okay. So it's a really delicious, fragrant tea. And so the story goes that the in the area where they were making this tea, they didn't want to share it with any outsiders. So they just named it the aroma of duck poop. So outsiders <laughs> wouldn't come and take it. That's so funny. Like traditional Chinese in a way. I mm-hmm. mean, because like there's also this whole kind of belief... That um, you shouldn't name th- you should kind of name things in a bad way to not anger the gods or so yeah. like my one of my cousins in China his nickname is Ugly Egg that's not his <laughs> that is not his real name but that's what he like grew up being called because you're supposed to call somebody you know but he was precious actually because he was a boy and the only child obviously under the one child policy but mm. you're gonna call him ugly eggs so the gods don't take him from you <laughs> what they call you you were the only female child for a long time mm, yeah my my nickname was like little professor <laughs> <laughs> now you are a grown-up professor yeah well you know I never got a PhD, so that was... A disappointment to your family yeah, for well, generations. Actually, it was because my dad was getting his PhD. That's why I got that name. Ah, got it. All right, so anyone who would like to try some of this delicious tea, again, it's called Yashir Xiang. Uh, it, you will notice that the name in English on the website is not poop. It's duck something else, just so you don't get confused. But you can buy it using our special affiliate link, uh, go.pathofcha.com slash unscripted. Get some great tasting tea, and you'll be helping out the show as well. I don't think people will be confused. I hope not, Shelley. Mm-hmm. I really hope not. All right, Josh, let's get to it. So last time you were on, well, we talked about a lot of crazy stuff, but we promised we would talk about uh, unrestricted warfare. And I know you've uh, advised military and academic communities on the Chinese Communist Party's unrestricted warfare, so I'm glad we can finally actually uh, get to it. Yeah, it's probably the, excuse me, when it comes to the defense issues, this is probably one of the most serious issues in the world, in in my opinion. And it's one that's unfortunately not well understood. Well, so what is unrestricted warfare? So unrestricted warfare, the term comes from a book written in, I think, 1999 by two Chinese colonels, or then colonels. They, they've moved up in ranks. Oh, congratulations and ba- to them. Yeah, good for them, yeah. right? But it basically set forth a, a new version of warfare. It was a war without morals. And it talked about— Do wars usually have morals? You know, there's Queensberry rules, there's rules of engagement, there are certain things you don't do to people because it's just too, like, morally wrong. Like how they stopped using mustard gas. After. Yeah, yeah, or flechette rounds and stuff like that, you know. You'd What's think, that? It's like shotgun shells that shoot a bunch of, like, galvanized needles and stuff. 
Wow. But, but, you know, of course, that's getting away from what this is. It's, <clears throat> it looks at three different categories of warfare, non-military, trans-military, and kind of asymmetrical military. Mm-hmm. And, I'm totally cool with trans-military, you know. You decide. <laughs> yeah, since it's coming, coming about, I guess. But, yeah, when you talk about that, it's um, non-military be things like drug warfare, culture warfare, psychological warfare. Um, it could be things like financial warfare, so on. When you talk about business warfare, you're targeting you're targeting individual companies. You're targeting like the death by a thousand cuts cuts approach. When you're talking about economic warfare. You're targeting things that impact the GDP of a country. When you talk about transaction warfare, it's how do you how do you infiltrate or how, how do you influence transactions in motion? For example, Amazon would be a transaction platform. Alibaba would be a transaction platform. If you look at like you know the, the, the other countries do this. For example. Um, I, I won't get into that. All right. But, so it's uh, basically a way to achieve the same ends of conventional warfare just without shooting bullets, soldiers, wait, blowing something up. Well, but what is the trans-military and asymmetrical So, military? so tra- trans-military be things, for example, like the cyber attacks. Asymmetrical, that's when you get into things like uh, biological warfare, um, what they call the, th- you know, the Assassin's Maze program. Um, <clears throat> you get into you know, anti-satellite warfare. Uh, terrorist warfare, that kind of thing. So Assassin's Mace, I mean, it's probably terrible, but it sounds kind of cool. What, <laughs> what, briefly, what is that? Assassin's Mace is the Chinese... If, if, the, if the United States were to go to war with China, Assassin's Mace would be the strategy they would use. Uh, Michael Pillsbury in his book, 100-Year Marathon, wrote that the only time the United States lost a military simulation was when he used the Assassin's Mace program against it. And in, in these military trainings, like the Red Team programs. Oh, so Pillsbury was on Red Team in one of those yeah, uh, simulations, yeah, he, and then yeah. he used the Chinese assassin's mace against the U.S. military in the simulation and won. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's in his book, uh, 100-Year Marathon. And basically, it's how do you, in, instead of, basically, this is the, the, the essence of a lot of this, is the Chinese Communist Party could not defeat the United States in troop-on-troop, head-on combat, at least not at the current stage. America. Yeah, that's right. So how do you achieve the same goals of warfare without having to engage in open warfare? Mm. And so they look at how do you how do you take an entire country when you're when you're a communist communist regime that controls every single element of your society? How do you weaponize every single element of your society? That's what unrestricted warfare does. But going back assassins mace, yeah, anti-satellite weapons. Okay, this is this is what it would look like. You'd have shipping containers, you know, land in all the ports. Nuclear weapons would detonate from them. You'd have what they call shoot and scoot operations of all the of all the Chinese spies doing terrorist attacks in all major U.S. cities. You would have, you know, assassinating the people who make in you know infrastructure work at all the military bases. They'd be targeting, you know, you, you like the individuals, like the the people who keep things running and their families. They would be, it would be attacks that look like they're being launched from like North Korea or countries not directly connected to China. It would be anti-satellite weapons knocking out our satellites. As soon as, as, soon as you hit those, GPS doesn't work, targeting systems don't work, navigation systems don't work, jets don't work, uh, troops can't talk to each other. They would, you know, many, many other things. They, they talk, I mean, if you read some of the few public reports on this, they talk about experiments on microwave weapons. For example, on animals, what are the what are the effect of microwave weapons on like the eyeballs of you know small animals and that kind of stuff? And there was that whole thing about um, potentially the use of sonic weapons at a U.S. consulate inside China. Yeah, and, and you could get into biological warfare as well. Um, I don't know if you know, but China actually processes a lot of the you know you get your DNA test and what race are you. A lot of that's processed in Chinese labs, like Twenty Three and Me type stuff. That, that kind of stuff. I don't, I don't know the exact names of the companies, but I know most of them go through Chinese labs. And so, you know, they talk about biometrics. They talk about targeting biometrics. That's being into biological warfare. Where Not you can, to mention, where you can, a lot of drugs are manufactured in China, too. Right, yeah, like and, all the and fentanyl. That's, uh, that's well, not just fentanyl, but pr- pharmaceutical drugs. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, that's and, and that ties into uh, drug warfare and culture warfare, which are under the unrestricted. They're listed, actually, directly in the unrestricted warfare doctrine. I'm already terrified, and it's been, what, 10 minutes? I know, just, just the look on your face has, I mean... That's so far the only part I'm enjoying, because I'm also terrified. Uh, drink some uh, tea, Shelley. Tea from Path of Cha. Go.pathofcha.com slash unscripted. 
Um, okay, well, so this does sound terrifying, but surely China isn't that far along in this, right? Well, <clears throat> they could... Let's, let's put it this way. It was made in a way where it's it's designed around surprise attack. When, okay, so let, let's let, we're talking about two separate things right now. We're talking about unrestricted warfare. And we're talking about Assassin's Maze program. Assassin's Maze program was designed for surprise attack. I mean, they, they could have launched it on a whim. There were, there was some speculation they were actually planning to do that. I think there was a Australian book called The Kingdom in the Quarry which said China was planning to do this, uh, according to some leaked documents, and, you know, the Obama administration allegedly responded what really happened. I mean, honestly, who knows? Mm-hmm. Um, when you get into unrestricted warfare, they are actively doing this on, on, on a very, very large scale. So it seems like the Assassin's Mace thing, like, so China doesn't want to get into a military confrontation with the United States. So it seems like the Assassin's Mace thing is something that is there for if it comes to that. Well, but unrestricted warfare is more what they're doing now. Well, so the Assassin's Mace would be warfare scenario, but it's designed around surprise attack. The purpose would be to make the United to hit the to hit a country so hard in in such with such ferocity and such extreme violence, and that you force them to the negotiating table within a week. Hmm. It is not made for drawn out combat. It's made for killing as many people as quickly as possible. And d- doing things that, say, destroy these systems that allow a military force to function, so the military itself becomes non-functional, at, le- at least for a small window enough to basically bring them to their knees. I think the reason China never did it was because two, you know, two points. One is, would it serve their interests internationally to do something so extremely violent and horrifying? What would what would the benefit of that be, and what would the you know, what would the consequences be? And I think that um, they just weren't far along enough with it yet. You know, if you do something like that, if you do something like that to a country, you need to deal with the ideological fallout, which is what is which is where we get into subversion and uh, unrestricted warfare, because a lot of that's based on ideology and uh, control of perceptions and these kinds of things. Well, why don't you tell us a bit more about that kind of ideological subversion? How does that play a role? Well, <clears throat> so, th- I mean, this has, a lar- this has a long history, not just the Chinese Communist Party, but communism, the Soviet Union. They talked about active measures. They talked about ideological subversion. Uh, from the get-go, this has always been a war of ideas, right? Mm-hmm. And when you look at the Chinese Communist Party today, I mean, ad- adopted into their military code is the three warfares doctrine. What is the three warfares? Psychological warfare media warfare and legal warfare and i mean then let's look at how that how that looks when it's actually applied is that the same as unrestricted warfare the three warfares doctrine um un, so unrestricted warfare is just kind of a name coined by these two chinese colonels it's not the official name the chinese communist party would use at least as far as i know um it was the name of the book they wrote where they proposed this new type of warfare um which most people who watch Chinese security issues do believe has been fully implemented. At least we can see individually every single thing they explain in it being practiced and having programs to practice it. Yeah, we recently talked to uh, retired Air Force General Robert Spaulding, who told us uh, some horrifying things about how far along that is. So people interested in more on this, check out um, that interview on China Uncensored. But uh, yes, carry on, Josh. But yeah, they they did adopt the Three Warfers doctrine into their military strategy. And Three Warfers, as I mentioned, is psychological warfare, lead, uh, legal warfare, and media warfare. And what is psychological warfare? Psychological warfare is not necessarily deceiving people. Well, it kind of is. It's not necessarily lying to people. It's changing the way you perceive information. And so you and I are both looking at the same picture I'm interpreting it one way, you're interpreting it in a way that's radically different from the way I'm interpreting it. So that's sort of like how some people can look at the Chinese Communist Party and see the greatest threat to the United States, and other people can see just a strategic, uh, not competitor, what was the word they used? Strategic cooperation. So China China can be friend. Or they can look at, at China and see, ooh, high-speed rail. Right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly like that. So, you know, psychological warfare is one part of it. Media warfare is another. This is not just control of news outlets, not just control of Chinese news outlets, but a control of all channels of information. How do you control what information is being displayed to people? 
That, that is when you get into the media warfare. Even here in the United States? Oh, yeah. Oh, heavily, yeah. Right, so maybe you can talk about how the Chinese Communist Party controls media in the United States, because it does sound a bit far-fetched. So I think it was ahead of the Beijing Olympics when uh, China launched China Daily in the United States, and Xinhua took over Times Square, and it was this big hoo-ha. Then they started placing inserts of China Watch in all the major U.S. newspapers. Um, if you remember Bloomberg News, for example, was, wrote some critical stories on China, and they got... Basically, the Chinese Communist Party threatened to pull their uh, Bloomberg terminals from China. They came out and said, we're not going to criticize them anymore. Um, journalists were getting uh, blacklisted in China if they reported on things the Chinese Communist Party didn't like. You had news outlets being, or journalists being forced to apologize for statements they made about the Chinese regime. I mean, pretty much all these things have continued. It's just that the media have learned to play the game, and so they just play along with it. When you talk about the financial interests, the way that the Chinese Communist Party is able to print, you know, full inserts of literal Chinese propaganda, not even trying to hide it, direct Chinese propaganda in major U.S. newspapers, and these these newspapers take the money, we, we assume, and print it. We don't know how much they make, at least as far as I know. Uh, yeah, that's a big issue. And then you're talking about, um, so for example, in, inside China, the way that the Chinese Communist Party manages a lot of the narratives as they say, follow Xinhua. Xinhua manages all the narratives. And then, of course, it's under the state council, the technical government of China. They have these annual meetings where Xinhua gets everyone together. Sorry, the state council gets everyone together. And they educate all the you know, local Chinese news outlets on how to report on issues and how, you know, what to say, what the narratives are, what the angles are. It's so like Hong Kong rioters. Yeah. And so the, Uyghur the, terrorists. And they, they replicated that for Western media as well. Hmm. Only instead of being done under the state council, it's done under Xinhua. And a lot of major U.S. newspapers are part of that. What do you mean it's done under Xinhua? No, it's like, a, you know, the annual gathering of Xinhua where they go and educate all the Western journalists on how to report on China. Wait, so you're saying that the Western journalists who have bureaus in Beijing or whatever go to these meetings? Well, yeah. But, I mean, like, they're free-thinking Westerners, so they're less likely to be influenced by this type of, you know, instructions from Xinhua. They're like, well, this is just Xinhua. We don't have to listen to them. It, it, it goes person by person. I, I know some journalists who, I, I know some very good people who have been there and reported the truth and get blacklisted. If you're there and you're not blacklisted, you're probably not telling the truth. Or at the very least, you're playing their games a little bit. Because if you tell the truth, you're not going to be there anymore. Recently, we did have Paul Mooney on, who was a longtime journalist in China until he got blacklisted. And, uh, yeah, he was kind of describing the situation of journalists in China, Western journalists in China, where it's, uh, yeah, since nobody really knows where the censorship line is, there's a lot of encouragement to just self-censor because you don't know what's going to get you blacklisted. I actually wonder, I think a lot of this actually happens at the level that's not at the journalist level, but at the corporation level, right? Like, like with, with Bloomberg. Bloomberg. Yeah. Um, or the New York Times or things like that where there seems to maybe be some, uh, you know, if you stop reporting on this stuff, then you can be let back into China or whatever. Yeah. We'll buy your terminals again. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I got the sense from Paul Mooney and, and other people that I've spoken with, as well as just some other frustrated journalists who, who had been in China, that it's the influence from the CCP and Western media is more about the stories that don't make it to print rather than the stories that do. So it's not like they're they're typically not directly reprinting Xinhua news propaganda. And they might cite, like, according to state-run media, blah, blah, blah. But but generally it's more about... Because I, I'm, I know I've been a journalist for, like, almost 20 years. And, you know, 90% of potential stories never get printed or never get aired. And that's just, you know, you have to select what's going to make the cut based on what you think is going to be the most interesting or whatever. So there's no possible way to do the entire set of possible stories. You have to narrow it down. And one way you can narrow it down is by avoiding things that are uh, going to potentially get you in trouble with the people who control your access to report in China. 
And of course, China uncensored. I mean, that's what you guys have done. You've reported all the things that they don't want you to report on. And mm-hmm. we're not in China. <laughs> we missed the Xinhua memo. Oh, well, yeah. Right. If, but, they, but, if, but, if they invited us, you know. I, yeah, seriously. But I think the, the important thing to hear is, you know, most people in America, they're not really getting their ideas and opinions from the news. They're getting it from TV. They're getting it from Hollywood. Well, and a lot of it happens at the education level. I mean, th- this this is where psychological warfare comes in. It's it's not necessarily it is the surface incident to some extent. You're talking about, you know, for example, uh, you know, what's happening in Xinjiang. Although other, I think I think that's kind of been opened up a bit. It seems Western media don't have a problem reporting on what they're doing to the Uyghurs. Yeah, I don't think you'd but find for, any Western media outlet saying, you know, they are probably terrorists. Yeah, but but for a long time that was one of the no go topics. For example, that was. Mm-hmm. But now it's kind of like okay, it's out there, report it. But but when you get really into psychological warfare, it's not that stuff so much. I mean, that, that's media warfare. That's controlling what can or cannot be said in terms of, you know, the big stories. When you get into psychological warfare, you're talking about altering the interpretation of the system itself or of the actions of the, of the regime itself. So, for example, the narrative of um, what they call the century of humiliation, where you 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 basically create this narrative that you— what they say is, oh, the Chinese, com- you know, Chinese, they just want to save face. And so you can't criticize them publicly. If you criticize them publicly, you're being mean. And so that's basically a way of saying no foreign official can ever publicly criticize what the Chinese Communist Party is doing to its people. And it creates this whole hundred year narrative of why the CCP came about and what it's doing and what it stands for and how it relates to ancient China. You know, it, it's it's this per- it's it's a it's a perception. It's, it's a something- very nationalistic type of like we're righting the wrongs of what the western imperialist powers did to us basically like during the opium wars of the 19th century yeah basically and so and so it, it's a narrative that one paints the ccp as a continuation of the ancient chinese systems which you'd be surprised even in the military community how many uh, military folks uh, understand it like that right which is ironic because that's not very like that's not very marxist <laughs> right like you're supposed to in marxism you're supposed to completely overthrow the superstructure of the old culture and build something completely new based on marxist ideology yeah people do but, that all the time though but they are like oh how we can use confucianism to understand the meritocracy of the chinese government yeah, or or they understand when you when you get into asymmetrical warfare and stuff they understand it only from the the standpoint of you know louds or sorry sun tzu and uh Art of war and stuff. Oh, that this yeah. whole unrestricted warfare stuff. This is actually just Sun Tzu. It's a, yeah, it's actually just traditional Chinese warfare. That that's how they. That's how a lot of them interpret it. Unfortunately, which is really a fundamental misunderstanding of I think communism and that worldview and, and, and of traditional Chinese warfare for that matter. Yeah. I thought you were going to say it was a misunderstanding of Sun Tzu. <laughs> it is. Well, it is. yeah, that's yeah. that's the flip side. But but so you're yeah, saying just, uh, Sun Tzu wouldn't advocate for you know, detonating nuclear bombs at American ports? Probably, probably not. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I mean, they wonder. hadn't even invented nuclear bombs yet, Matt, so. That's true. But they had yeah. ports. But, but yeah, just to finish up the three, the three warfare's doctrine, the last one would be media, or sorry, uh, legal warfare. And that, that's basically manipulating the laws of different countries and of the international community. So, for, for example, uh, they have a saying, strangle you with your own systems. Hmm. How, how do you take the culture and laws of a country and use it against them, right? So we have this politically correct culture, and so they'll have any time someone, say, they arrest a Chinese spy or criticize a Chinese Communist Party, they'll have their overseas groups, such as a Committee of 100, say, oh, this is just discrimination, you're just racist, this is all a race issue, and you're just being unfair to the Chinese, the Chinese people, this is offensive to the Chinese people, and how dare you be so insensitive? I know that's a big problem in Australia. Right yeah, now. yeah. I mean, it's not just in Australia, but that was definitely happening when we were there, and Clive Hamilton published. Yeah, it just book. it just seems to have stand out a bit more there. It's happening here in the U.S. too, but I don't know. In Australia, it just seemed because you had major Australian politicians like uh, what's his name, Sue Parmesan say like also criticizing Clive Hamilton and being racist. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so let's let's look at a, a real world kind of example of three warfares playing out. And three warfares is just a tiny piece of unrestricted warfare. Um, so, for example, South China Sea, what do mm-hmm. they do? Right, you create an ideological smokescreen. 
you say you you create a new narrative, a new history, right? The history, the, the, the psychological warfare element is changing the perception of China's ownership of that region. China mm-hmm. has historical ownership. Mm-hmm. It was wrongly taken from us after World War II. The Japanese were evil imperialists. The Americans just went along with them because they were fooled by them. Any any intrusion here is, is say, uh, bringing up these, opening these old wounds that China has suffered in World War II against the evil Japanese. And so how dare you, you know, try to say that China doesn't own this, this land. Here's, here's our maps from the Qing dynasty. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You see? So that, that, that's the psychological warfare element. Then there's the media warfare element. All the Chinese sources, you know, of course, in, in the West, we have a culture. In our media, a lot of times where you cite both sides of an argument, even if one side is lying, mm-hmm. you know, in the case of the Chinese Communist Party. Um, the, it's, e- it's easy to manip- it's easy to manipulate media. It's so easy if you're a government. You can send, you know, this former Chinese official, say a high-ranking official, to any media and say, hey, this, the former director of this Chinese government branch wants to talk to you, and he'll give you the real story of what's happening in China. And every news outlet's going to have him on, and they're going to talk to him, and they're going to present everything he says. Wait, where can I find this guy? I want to talk to him. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, you, you bring that up, and I've noticed it when we do China Uncensored episodes— we subscribe to content from Reuters. And one thing that you get in the Reuters feed is for every major China story, there's a video of a press briefing from China's foreign ministry. And you will have that and you'll have their perspective on it, their sound bites, but often you won't have any other perspective on it. But since you only have that one video available on Reuters, you're like, well, at least I have something, at least I have their response. But it is in fact, the Communist Party's official response to every issue. And, you know, you do, I think that I do feel sometimes some pressure to, like, you know, show what that is. I mean, on China Uncensored, we can kind of make fun of it. But even so, it's still there. But also, you know, a thousand other media subscribe to Reuters, and they are getting it, and they are often showing it, you know, side by side with some other perspective. Yeah, and it could be done in softer ways, too. Let's say, for example, a, a journalist at a major newspaper writes an article that is critical of the CCP that criticizes what the Chinese Communist Party is doing. Well, easy. You have you have your students with the CSSAs, the Chinese Student Scholar Associations, write a bunch of emails and, st- and tell them how offensive his article was. Then you have one of your Committee of 100 guys, uh, you know, some big, say, relatively influential academic, come and come to them and say, your article was so offensive, it was you know, insensitive to the Chinese people. It, it is totally ignorant of the history. And the guy's going to get on his knees and beg for forgiveness and say, I'm not, I didn't mean to sound racist. I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to offend you because he's trying to be a nice guy. And then the guy's going to say, oh, well, it's okay. You know, you're just this American and you're fed all this false information on China. And I understand. And let me tell you the real story. That, that guy is going to get on his knees. He's going to report every single word that comes out of the guy's mouth. It's so easy to manipulate journalists if they're if they don't really know what's going on when it comes to this stuff, and you know you're dealing with an industry where a lot of people have high turnover. They're going to be doing it for five years and they get a PR job because it's high pressure. You know, and there's like, not as many people working. Like one reporter now has to do the writing, the shooting. Well, uh, and, and not to mention if you went to journalism school. And you went to a school that had like a Confucius Institute and, you you know, half of your education was based on Chinese Communist Party narratives from the get go anyways. Mm. You know, you're, you're fed you're fed a lot of their narratives, whether you like it or not. I think what's interesting is all this seems to tie back to some f- like fundamental concepts that you see in communism. The idea of, you know, you divide society into the oppressed and the oppressors and you get the oppressed to struggle against the oppressors. Yeah. Well, so who's the oppressed in this situation? The well, that's Chinese the thing. Communist Party? They they are portraying themselves as the oppressed who have dealt with all these problems historically. And so that's why, you know, you can't criticize them because that's racist and 100 years of humiliation, century of humiliation. Yeah, well, a lot of those narratives are just they they're not real. They they're just they're just pawns. They they're the, they're the they're the fish they're the, you know, fish food. They're the, they're the bait. That's all they are. It's a big topic. But let me let me finish what I'm saying about the South China Sea first. Okay. So we talked about media example of media warfare, example of uh, 
psychological warfare. But the, ele- the element of legal warfare in the South China Sea was they locked it up in the international courts, and mm-hmm. they locked it up within the Chinese courts. Eventually, the international court deemed that China did not have historical ownership of the region, and China said, well, according to our laws, we have historical ownership, and let's see you question that. Yeah. And so they, they kept the, while the Chinese Communist Party was going in there, taking over land, building, you know, building military bases and islands, building islands, uh, creating this whole defense, new defense circle, no country could intervene militarily because it was not a military conflict. It was a it was a war of narrative. It was a legal conflict. It was a psychological conflict. It was mm-hmm. a media conflict. It was being fought in those realms. And so there was no intervention in a physical sense. And so by using that as a smokescreen, they were able to carry out their operations and succeed in what they were doing. Well, how would you counter that? Like, is yeah. there a way to counter that? Like, like what, could, what could the U.S. government have done in 2012 to stop the you know construction of of island military bases not, nothing short of taking a very hard stance and saying we will not budge we will we will sink your ships we will not move if you try to do it like could the us have landed troops on the shoals they're, they're talking about it now actually if you, if you read if you read the the recent in fact just i think past couple of days the new uh, the new defense guidance for the U.S. Marine Corps is actually based on that. You know, I've heard that the South China Sea has been part of U.S. territory since ancient times. <laughs> <laughs> it was briefly. <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah. But but really, um, yeah, this is, I mean, you get in, this is where you get into the issue of modern warfare in general based on that question. They, they talk about short-of-war tactics. How do you bring something right to the very edge of the rules of engagement? And if you're doing it against a country like the United States, everything is transparent and you know exactly where that line is. It's, it's one of the big questions the U.S. military is struggling with because not just China, but a lot of our adversaries use short-of-war tactics. I mean, Russia, Iran, Iran is involved a lot in subversion, for example. Um, you know, you talk about things like the drug cartels. Does what, is what they're doing, does that constitute war? That's why there's a big talk now about making them, you know, designating them a terrorist organization. Mm. That you you can push the envelope right to the very edge, and the U.S. will not be able to respond militarily. That that's the issue we we have, and that's how a lot of these countries uh, do their warfare programs against a country that is very transparent with its uh, with its laws. Yeah, it sounds like I mean it's a totally different way of approaching combat than the U.S. is used to. Like I, in some ways, I don't think. This is this sounds weird to say, but I don't think the, the U.S. is like devious enough to figure this out. Yeah, well, and th- that's the thing. I mean, I've talked to a lot of military guys, and when you when you tell them about the stuff, they're like, they they see it, they understand it. Like, yeah, totally, that's how it works. I mean, it's getting better these days. A lot of them actually know about the stuff these days. But back when I was first working on the stuff in like two thousand eight to two thousand, you know, two thousand ten, for example, I mean, they had never heard any of this. Mm. They, this was all new information. I mean, to a lot of them, at least, this was all new information. Like, what the heck are you talking about? Um, even cy- even cyber warfare was not really a known and, say, issue that was taken seriously until Operation Aurora against Google in about 2010. Mm. When you they know? hacked uh, Gmail, right? Yeah, that's right. Well, it's interesting that they hadn't heard of this because, like, these... Didn't China just take a lot of the same tactics the Soviet Union used and just updated them and modernized them? Yeah, so basically, sorry, basically the Chinese Communist Party is using a continuation of what the Soviets did. When you get into the, this is when you get into ideological subversion, the whole nature of what the Cold War was, for example, was all based on this. In, in the war in Vietnam, for example, uh, the Viet Cong would say they fought two wars. There was the war of bullets and the war of words, and they won the war of words, and that won the war. Hmm. You know what I mean? And so it, it's all it's it's manipulation. It's it's infiltrating the institutions that allow a country to function, altering the way they function, and achieving your goals through that. I mean, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a ve- it's a very long history. But yeah, the, the Chinese Communist Party basically took all the tactics the Soviet Union had made, and I would say perfected them in a lot of ways. They're they're much better at it. Shelley, do you have a question? You just seem so concerned. I am really concerned. 
uh, well, it just seems actually, I think the most horrifying thing to me seems like there's no way to counter it. it you just feel like, oh, well, then you're just a sitting duck. Like, what are you going to do against this thing oh. that's attacking you from all sides? Oh, it gets it gets much, much worse. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Well, I, I don't. I can't remember. Maybe we talked about this before. Maybe it was on when I. I think I went on uh, China and Censor one time talking about, so for example, United Front operations and uh, more open forms of subversion. Mm-hmm. But I guess we can go into that again. Yeah, I mean, that this was a while. Year, ago. That was years ago yeah. on a different show, technically. I mean, so ju- just okay. So let's let's step back and talk a bit about how the Soviet Union would do this kind of stuff. Now, what is it? They they looked at warfare in terms of how do you attack the soul of a nation? How do you attack the values of a nation? Because, you know, during the time of the Soviet Union, they're looking at how do we spread the communist revolution? Mm -hmm. It just happened that the example of the United States, a country based on this idea that people, if given almost, you know, pretty relative, I mean, relative to most systems in all human history, pretty much complete freedom, can create a, a stable and harmonious society and manage markets themselves and have things work decently well, um, as opposed to a totalitarian communist regime that controls every single element of your life, manages all, you know purchases, what products are available, companies, everything. If people look and see the example that life would be better if the communist party was not there, that, that's, that's a major detriment to the, the narrative they're trying to push. And so they had to attack that narrative. They had to attack that perception. And so how do you infiltrate countries? How do you, you, know, how do you, how do you spread the revolution? Well, you have to look at the things that are blocking the spread of the revolution. And it just so happens a lot of that was uh, moral society, communities, you know, the churches and stuff like this. And not, not just you know, Christianity, Catholic, Catholicism, but even in China, for example, Confucianism, uh, Buddhism, any any foundational moral principle or uniting element within the society that allowed people to be independent of, you know, say, totalitarian rule um, had to be destroyed. And so, I mean, I'm, it, it, we can go deep into this if you want. This is when you get into dialectical materialism. How, how do you manufacture? How do you manufacture revolutionary movements? It gets into ideological subversion of how do you render the things that make a country function non-functional how do you alter the culture of a country how do you destroy the values of a country how do you corrupt their youth how do you poison them with drugs how do you destroy their their entertainment how do you make them completely let's say docile how how do you do that to a person do how, we, how do, do we want you, to go down that wow. rabbit hole are or? you saying that that's what the chinese communist party is doing it is, and it's what the Soviet Union did. And so, un- well, like, what's a, what's a clear example of one of those things that the Soviets or the Chinese Communist Party did that is like kind of obvious in the U.S.? Well, I mean, let's let's look at what they did first in their own countries. What is the Communist Revolution? We look at the Communist Manifesto. I, th- I think people a lot, a lot of times when they think of communism, they think, oh, sharing wealth and being tolerant of people, you know, these kinds of things. It, they, they, it's not what it's about. It was never about that. The, the, reason we, the reason we debate communism as an economic system is because Marx was terrible at economics. It was never meant to be that. It's because Marx was a moron when it came to economics. Um, by the time of Marx, in fact, and socialism, communism predate Marx by, geez, quite a long time at least 50 years i think uh this is what you guys talked about last time i think right yeah, yeah that's right we talked about last time but you know restif de lebron i think uh, I, they called him the rousseau of the gutter in the circle social was the first one i think who coined the term communism for example mm-hmm. now by the time of marx the the narrative of communism the, the narrative of socialism had already failed it was dead the 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 whole movement was dead because it could not hold up in debates against uh, sociologists and you know economists, in terms of sociology and economy, it could not hold its ground. It was not. It was seen as a non-functional, retarded system that would never work. So Marx came about, and he wrote. You know, the, he wrote, of course, the Communist Manifesto, which is like a little handbook that uneducated people will read, and you know, because they're not going to read anything really in depth, and say, okay, I get it now. This is about overthrowing the people who are oppressing me. 
And then he wrote Das Kapital, which reinterpreted the entire story of human of humanity, basically. And it interprets all of human history and through the idea of the oppressor against the oppressed, the struggle of people against the oppressors, right? And it paints every single power dynamic in all of human history as being part of this struggle. So, you know, women are oppressed by their husbands. Uh, people are oppressed by their landlords. Everyone's oppressed by their government. Uh, morality and gods oppress the human free spirit. Th this is the narrative, right? And he, he goes through and paints this whole picture of the five stages of civilization and what he interpreted as uh, being primitive communism, the agrarian society, uh, capitalism, then he believed capitalism would naturally become more oppressive. It would become the socialist state of the dicta the dictatorship of the proletariat. In other words, a dictatorship where the all means of production and all elements of the society are seized by the government. People no longer have the ability to, you know, engage in free trade or anything like that. And eventually the whole thing will collapse and then you'll have communism. And communism would be the return to that pure state, Marx believed, of primitive communism. Only now you have it with this high-tech state. And so it's funny because Marx, in the beginning of Das Kapital, he, he criticizes all human progress. He criticizes uh, human culture. He criticizes everything that humanity was. And then about, you know, towards the end of it, he paints this idea of this high-tech communism. It's funny because New York Times just said something maybe a year ago or several months ago about, you know, we need high-tech communism. And this is where, the, you know, they talk about, oh, you don't have to work anymore because robots do all the work for us. And you could just, you know, Wait, it's this. this Marx talked about robots? It's this brave new world. This is, you know, like the book Brave New World kind of thing where uh, humanity no longer has morals and no longer has traditions and you have been liberated. And so you can indulge in all the, you know, what traditional society would see as sins because morals themselves were just oppressive ideas placed upon us and so you're now freed and everyone's an artist and a poet and look how happy you are this is marx's version of utopia basically yes but of course to achieve that they believed you had to destroy everything now fair trade-off yeah and so one one of the and so basically just so i finish up this original point um by the time of marx this socialism communism had already failed they, they couldn't hold up in, in these arguments and so what Marx did was it por is portrayed the economists and sociologists as being the bourgeois class. And he said, you no longer need to debate them on economic grounds because they are the oppressors <laughs> as well. And then you had a whole bunch of... And then, and then he also said that you can't even try to interpret what communism would look like, so you can't say whether it would work or not because that's something of the future and who knows what it will look like. And so, so he basically shut down all the debate. Basically. And, and, he, and he, he said that um, it can, you know, it can be anything. You don't know what it's going to be. And so you had all kinds of different branches of socialism spring up, none of which would listen to any criticism from outside or even academic analysis on whether it was practical or not. So you had Christian socialism, you had uh, economic socialism, you had military socialism, you know, all these different branches of socialism. And a lot of early early 1900s academics, um, for example, um, Ludwig von Mises, for example, was a classical liberal. Um, you know, basically, and not just him, but a lot of academics who opposed communism in the early 19th century, or early 20th century, you know, like 1910-ish, mm -hmm. um, wrote that a lot of people, when they criticized capitalism, they weren't even criticizing capitalism anymore. They were, they were criticizing the, the fallout of interventionist socialist policies that had been introduced into the capitalist system. By that time, you could not, you could not see a system that had not been influenced by these things. Wait, how did it go from like a dead theory to something that was affecting the economies of the world? Well, I mean, let's just say a lot of these ideas were adopted in various forms, piece by piece, basically from the time of Marx up until, you know, Bolshevik Revolution up until the 1950s. You had pieces of it being implemented. And, you know, we talk about the economic reforms, you talk about um, unions, not saying unions themselves were bad per se. You know, I think that the guild system was great. But when you talk about all these workers' movements and different things that had sprung up, yeah, a lot of them had socialist elements, and a lot of them did implement different parts of it. Using and, sort and then, of like a proto- 
unrestricted warfare kind of strategy well, or something? Well, that, that, that's a bit different. I think, I think anyone who was using those kind of tactics was not doing it out of goodwill. There, there were, I think there are two different strains of communism. There is the, the ones who do it because they actually believe that it's something good and they believe that they're acting out of goodwill for humankind and they don't understand what they're doing. And then there are the ones who actually understand how it works. And I think you, if you understand how it works and you're promoting it still, there's no way you have goodwill towards humankind. You, it's, is it for a power thing? Well, this, this is when you get into dialectical materialism. So what, what is communism really? So I talked about Marx, talked about the five stages of civilization. Now, keep in mind, a lot of people interpreted the idea of progress of societies. We talked about Adam Weishaupt before with the Illuminati of Bavaria, uh, late 1700s. In the letters published at that time, he actually had very similar ideas of, you know, social evolution and these types of things. I think he had five, or sorry, seven stages, if I remember right. Please refer to the first podcast we did with Joshua Quill. <laughs> Yeah, and it was it was a real thing. I'm not talking I'm not talking conspiracy here. You can still find public domain copies of his letters and stuff. Going back again, sorry, this is, this has multiple levels you kind of need to unfold, and it, you have to kind of know a lot of things to unpack even one part of it. It's, it's, I think it's why a lot of people have trouble understanding it is because it's so complicated. Basically, at the time of Marx. I mentioned a lot of people interpret communism as an economic system. They only do that because that's where the debate ended, because communists could not stand up when it came to, you know, debating on whether it's economically feasible or if, you know, it works with sociology or praxology, as some of them called it. But when it first formed, it was not that. It was a, it was a metaphysical theory. It was a theory of ontology. It was a theory of what is the nature of human existence, what is uh, the pur- what is the purpose of life? Sorry, ontology. It's it's this the study of meaning in human. What is the purpose of life? Why are you alive? Yes, I know, but that was for Shelley. Oh. <laughs> okay, thanks, Chris. <laughs> sure, I could tell you were. <laughs> I so was confused. very confused. Yeah. And 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 metaphysics being, is there is there something beyond the material realm? And and keep in mind that um, at the time, of course, of Marx, you know, athe- atheism was a new idea. A lot of even early communist systems had, uh, say, religious elements in them, which were pretty dark and which I think we talked about before. We did. Please listen to the first podcast. <laughs> and so keep in mind that at the time when Marx formed these ideas, uh, the, the main um, metaphysical theory in Europe, a lot of Europe, European countries at the time, was the Hegelian dialectic. Um, some people have talked about it as like thesis, antithesis, synthesis. Right, it's it's the the process of change within a, within a society. And of course, some people talk about modern social movements and people who want to interfere in these social movements as using the Hegelian dialectic. How do you alter the the outcome of a process in motion? It's like a judo con- concept. How do I redirect your force? How do I change where you're heading? How do I look at the developments taking place in a society? and manipulate those developments so that the end goal changes into something that benefits me, right? That's Hegelian dialectic. And so when you get into Marx, Marx looked at that and said, okay, I'll keep some parts of this. And what did he keep? He kept, this, he kept the idea that conflict leads forward, and he kept the idea of what they call the negation of the negation, and he adopted these into dialectical materialism. Now, what is the negation of the negation? The, now, this was a metaphysical concept of the nature of human, uh, say, evolution or progress and these types of things. So, for example, the negation of the negation, through the destruction of a seed, the plant is born. Through the destruction of the egg, the chicken is born. Through, through the destruction of a pre-existing social institution or pre-existing system, a new, th- a new and greater thing will be born, be, uh, sorry, be born from it. And so... Marx took that and said, well, in order to create the communist system, obviously, we have to destroy society. We have to destroy all previously existing concepts. We need to destroy religion. We need to destroy morality. If you read the Communist Manifesto, it says that directly that communism destroys all religion and all morality. If you don't believe me, look it up. I read it recently. It's exactly what you said. Yeah. Destruction of the family. And so through the destruction of the pre-existing institutions... 
then something new will come about. And Marx says, what is that new thing? That will be communism. What does it look like? You cannot imagine what it will look like because we don't know what it will look like. Well, that's convenient. <laughs> but of course, you know... What a philosopher. But of course, you know, you destroy a person's body, you kill them. So it, 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 the, the theory has a, a very quick end to it, you know. You can only destroy something so much before you actually destroy it. Right, but the, the ramifications of destroying religion and morality and the family structure are not as obvious or short-term as destroying a person physically. Yeah, of course, of course. And so this gets into um, dialectical materialism. And dialectical materialism is a way to manufacture social movements. It's a way to manufacture antithesis. And keep in mind, I mentioned Marx believed in social evolution, right? the five stages of civilization. When you talk about progress, it's about pushing humanity along the along that progressive train of destroying culture, morality, traditions, belief, etc. Right? Um, how do you speed up the evolutionary process when it comes to a social when it comes to the social realm, or I mean not just that, I guess any any realm when it comes to this stuff, because they attack all realms. Well that's where you get into dialectical materialism. And so one of the ideas I mentioned that Marx kept from the Hegelian dialectic was that conflict leads forward. Right, social Darwinism, survival of the fittest. You you create a conflict, and the strongest survives. You create a you you in, you increase the uh, tensions. You increase the conflict within a movement, and through manufacturing that conflict, you speed up the process of the society's progression. According to this theory, honestly, like so much of what you're saying sounds like the Chinese Communist Party. Yes, exactly. Well, you know, look at the Cultural Revolution. They did it. They did it very directly. Right. That's it's exactly, yeah. exactly what it was. Whereas, you know, of course, when it, when they seize power, when a communist system seizes, and of course, communism, communism is more the goal or the idea. Socialism is the government, uh, you know, system to implement it. Basically, there's no such thing as a communist government by by these definitions, because communism would exist at, through the collapse of government, essentially. Mm-hmm. And so, in, I mean, and even there were a lot of. Uh, when you get into groups like, uh, geez, like the sophisters of anarchy and chaos, one of the, one of the original groups that pushed for this stuff, for example. What decade are we talking about now? This is pre-French Revo- or French Revolution time, right? We talk, we talk about the, the sophisters of anarchy and chaos. We wow, talk, we that's an about, awesome name. I know. I was going to say, we just call them the OG. <laughs> when, you, when, you, when, you, when you talk about some of the original groups that were doing these kinds of things, right? Um, they, they were looking at it more directly. Right. So how how do you? Sorry, I lost my train of thought. Yeah. We were talking dialectical about materialism. <laughs> well, I have a question about yeah. the Hegelian dialectic thing. Thesis, mm-hmm. antithesis, synthesis. What is the synthesis part? They just believe that you 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 have to destroy the concepts of good and evil. Well, so of course Marx did away with that. Mm-hmm. Mark Marx did away with the synthesis part. He his theory dialectical materialism was based on identify, contradict, and eliminate the middle. It was a process of manufacturing antithesis. Mm-hmm. It was not about synthesis. It was not about the, the merging of opposites. It was about the destruction of opposites, destroying both sides of it, because through destruction, he believed you could create communism. Com- the, the communist system that Marx made was, was not a proposal of a new system. It was a criticism of all existing institutions and systems. He did not propose a system to, to replace it with. He said that if you destroy it, something will naturally replace it, and the thing that naturally replaces it would be communism. Did he know what would naturally replace it? I, I think he did. Uh, if you if you were to ask me, I'd say that Marx knew exactly what he was doing, and I, I think he had a lot of hatred for humanity. If if you read his letters to Engels, for example, he thought people who believed in communism were stupid. He 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 called it that class s h i t. Right, mm. he he he, he, <laughs> he called his own theories that class. Well, because because that was not the purpose. Mm-hmm. The purpose was to incite struggle. The purpose was to create social movements. The purpose was to get people to destroy their values, to rebel against their cultures, to hate everything they were, and to you know basically go along with he wanted to, with what he wanted to create. Um, even I mentioned. Um, for example, the sophisters of anarchy and chaos, the early anarchists also believed in a similar thing. Only they believed that through through the practice of personal anarchy, you could achieve intentional communism. 
In other words, by internally destroying your own morality and your recognition of hierarchy, you would achieve the communist goal without having to go through socialist dictatorship. It's like an individual kind of communism. Yeah, ba basically. Self-help for communists. And so a, per a person who no longer has uh, concepts of right and wrong, who no longer has concepts of good and evil, um, and we can maybe it is important to mention this briefly, but we can talk about the origins of communism. I won't, we won't go into the whole thing. But it was based on the original heresy, which is, you know, it was, it was against religion originally, which is, it was this idea of if God is righteous, then why does evil exist in the world? If everything was created by God, then how does evil exist? Why does suffering exist in the world, right? That, that was the original question. And so when you had people who formed the whole, you know, Luciferian doctrine, they said, well, obviously if God is good and he created everything and evil exists, then God must not be good because evil exists and it was created by him. And so they called God the Demiurge, and they formed a new system that, meant that was based around rebelling against moral order. So instead of, say, following the Ten Commandments, they would violate the Ten Commandments. That was their interpretation of it. It was a naturist system, the idea that humanity liberated, quote-unquote, from morality would be the true man. You guys talked a little bit about this in the last podcast, too. Yeah. yeah. And so, and so, of course, you know, that, get, that goes into the whole history of all these freaky movements throughout most of medieval Europe and so on. Right, but if we look at, for example, um, that kind of influence uh, that the Soviets and the Chinese communists had on the U.S., like how did they take this, uh, how did they take these Marxist ideas and then try to implement them in the U.S. as a kind of ideological warfare? Right, so when you so so we'll go into now the idea of what dialectical materialism does. It is identify, contradict, and eliminate the middle. It is a formula to manufacture conflict within any existing social system. Um, it is not something just targeted. You know, like the original ones are more targeted just against Christianity, which is why in the French Revolution you had the dechristianization movement and these types of things. The later ones, when it came to Marxism and what he was doing was a formula to basically destroy any culture, any tradition, any belief anywhere in the world. You could not have something based on only one religion because then you'd, you would only be targeting, say, the Christian countries, and you can't achieve the global communist revolution if even a single country hasn't fallen to it, basically. Hmm. And so, you know, for example, um, when you, let's get into the idea of ideological subversion during the Soviets' time. Um, these they call these active measures. There's a, I mean, really good uh, presentation done by a guy named Yuri Bezmenov. You can still find his videos on YouTube. They, some people think they killed him. He died under mysterious circumstances. YouTube killed him. <laughs> <laughs> YouTube traveled back in time. Yeah, but <laughs> basically he was a he was a Soviet propagandist, and he talked about how they used ideological subversion. And the communist, a lot of the communist parties' unrestricted warfare programs are based on the same basic principles. There are other books on this, um, for example, uh, Disinformation by Ihan Mihai Pachepa and Ronald Reichlack is a very good one, more, which talks about their subversion of uh, religious movements and so on. So, for example, just bouncing off of that, if we look at how they infiltrated Latin America, the first guy they had was Che Guevara. Che Guevara got killed because he did some stupid things. They executed him. The revolution died. But so he was they, then on T-shirts. Well, so. well, that, that's the thing. That's and so, and so they, they decided to create him as an image of the revolution, mm. an icon of the revolution, something to appeal to the youth. And then they realized that Latin America could not be subverted through those means because the religious society was too strong there. And so what did they do? They created liberation theology, a new interpretation of Christianity based on support for the communist revolution. They re they redrew Jesus as a revolutionary, fighting against the you know the, the bourgeois. He didn't he didn't overturn the tables of the, of the money changers. He overturned the tables of the capitalists, for example. You know it was this it was this new image of Jesus as the rebel. This new image of Jesus as the revolutionary. And if you did not support the revolution, then you were not a con then you were not a Christian. You were not a Catholic. That was the idea of liberation theology, and the communists spread it through all of Latin America and made its way into the U.S. as an example. 
So, so in other words, they inverted the Christian system and they, they altered it into something else and created a new religion that supports the communist revolution. Whereas at the time, um, you know, going back, if, if you were a communist, you could be excommunicated from the Catholic Church. And actually, if you want to read some really, I talked about dialectical materialism, these types of things, actually the Pope um, who first made that, I can't remember which one it was, it might have been Pope Pius, one of them, I know there were a few of them. There's, there, there are several Pope Pius. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm not a Catholic, so I don't know all this stuff, but, yeah, but you can read the writings, just look up um, when the Pope excommunicated communists in his writings. He actually has a really good, really good writings about uh, dialectical materialism and how it's designed to increase the, the um, say, hatred in society, to, incre- to increase the antagonisms in society, because through increasing those antagonisms, they believed you create conflict, and the idea that conflict leads forward, and that's the essence of the communist movement, basically. The movements are not the purpose. The conflict is the purpose, you see. Mm-hmm. Because the conflict is the, is the wearing away. It's the withering away of the system. It's, it's the one where people destroy their morals through the struggle of opposites. And so the Soviet Union and the Chinese Communist Party has been manufacturing the struggle in U.S. society? Well, if you if you were to ask me, the the Soviets were doing it more directly to spread to spread the communist revolution. I think in the in the early days of it, they were actually doing it because they actually wanted to spread the end goal of communism. I think the CCP these days is more interested in maintaining its power. They're not interested in communism. They're main, they're interested in maintaining the socialist dictatorship and the China model of what that encompasses. So, in other words, what you're saying is China is not real communism. Yeah, yeah, I mean, they, they are and they aren't. I mean, I, in, 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 t- in, ter- in terms of their active destruction of human morality, in terms of what they're doing, absolutely. In terms of their effect on a society, absolutely. I mean, Xi Jinping still references dialectical materialism. But, but in, ter- oh, yeah. in terms of yeah. the idea of them ever wanting to relinquish power and destroy the system that, you know, they exist in, I, somehow, don't, think, I don't think they're interested in that. Somehow every communist who got into power never really wanted to give up the reins of power. Yeah, typically not. But to achieve communism, they believed that this, the socialist system would have to collapse. It would have to, they would have to relinquish power. You know, that was, it was one of the big narratives. I mean, of course, it, it, it doesn't, it's not practical. It doesn't work. I mean, no, we're not, I'm not talking about it like it's an actual functioning system. Mm-hmm. It doesn't work. It's not practical. It, 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 it does not achieve what they said it would achieve. You know, and the Communist Party, the Chinese Communist Party is a great example of that. Well, I, I mean, they did they did increase equality after the communist revolution and, and took over in 1949, right? I mean, they they basically flattened everything, right? So that basically people all across the country were equally poor, equally starving, equally, you know, collectivized. But I think that's from what Josh is saying, like a misinterpretation of communism then that yeah. like they're not really about creating equality. No, no, no. It's it, it's it's about destroying society. You know, you, if if you're talking about creating equality, you're not talking about uplifting the poor to become more successful. You're talking about pulling down the rich to make them poorer. You you're talking about destroying the incentives for rising up in society. You're talking about destroying the incentives of being someone who holds any kind of authority or power over others. You're talking about flattening society, not upward, but downward. I think that describes the communist, I mean, the cultural revolution pretty well. You did not want to be anybody who was in any kind of position of authority. Yeah, I mean, but, and, yeah. and the other side of it, too, is when you talk about Lenin, when you talk about Mar- when you talk about Mao Zedong, a lot of the movements were not proletarian revolutions. They were lumpen proletariat revolutions. It's using the scum of society. As, as that's Mar- what uh, Mao Zedong called it, for example, using the scum of society to, you know, um, you know, basically is the tools of the revolution. I had a great guy on my show, Crossroads, actually talking about this, uh, Jeff Nyquist. And he was talking about how in Lenin's, some of Lenin's writings, he was like, people ask why I surround myself with these criminals and these, ev- you know, these devious people. He says, I can start a revolution with these people. I can't start a revolution with these, you know, dusty intellectuals. You know, he, they surround themselves with people who don't have a problem with killing and robbing, because that's what that's what the communist revolution is based on. You need to, in, in order to implement it, you need to convince people that killing and robbing and taking things from others is somehow 
uh, a righteous act. That's where you get into the whole narratives of uh, the oppressors and you're fighting for, you know, you're fighting oppression by killing and robbing these people. Well, so then it makes sense in the context of um, China attempting to destroy American society in this uh, modern-day Cold War kind of situation. Yeah. And so the, the, yeah, Matt, Matt had asked about um, how the Soviet Union was doing this, and I mentioned Yuri Bezmenov's writing. So he, he did some videos you can find on YouTube. He also did a really good book called Love Letter to America, which, I mean, it's hard to find, you, but you can find uh, PDFs online. Highly recommend reading. But he, he basically, you know, he has a whole chart where he breaks it down. What they did was they looked at all the institutions that allow a country to function. There's health, life, security, government, business, um, society, you know, your, your community. You're looking at police forces and people's trust in the police forces and rule of law. You're looking at um, the public health. You're looking at entertainment. You're looking at religion. You want to target every one of these. You want to send individuals to infiltrate them and from inside of them make them serve the opposite function of what they're meant to serve. The legal systems, for example, should no longer defend people against evil people. They should represent evil people, right? They should defend the rights of the evil against the right of against the good. You make it so that they no longer protect the innocent. They they then become, you know, movements, for example, to struggle against uh you know, for example, I had a guy on, um, on my show as well, Alando Santos in Brazil. He talked about some of the movements where they painted, you know, say cartel assassins as just these poor individuals about hard lives, and they just had to go through that. And so we shouldn't punish them for being assassins and murderers. They're they're just misunderstood and just had hard lives. We don't want to public, you know, punish drug dealers because oh, they just they're just trying to make money. We, we don't want to punish people who violate our laws, right? Because they're just, they're the ones who are poor and downtrodden and misunderstood. Once you destroy rule of law, you start to destroy, you start to destroy the fabric of what allows uh, society to exist. You start to destroy one of the foundations of a And it sounds like the system. fundamental ideas of what's good and evil. Yeah, I mean, right and, and, and this is just one example. Yeah, when they infiltrated religion, for example, they created the world count. They infiltrated the world council, the churches. They created liberation theology. They infiltrated the Catholic Church. Um, great book on this. I mentioned uh, disinformation by Ian Miapichepa and Ronald Reichlack. Um, they they lay out the history very well. But there's there's other books as well in this. You want to turn the church into something that something that was once meant to represent salvation and. Uh, you know, something beyond this world. You want to make it mundane. You want to make people focus on politics, not on religion. You want to you want to make them focus on indulgences, not values. You want to turn it into entertainment. You want to turn it into things that represent the social movements, like with liberation theology. You want to turn it into things that serve the interests of the Communist Party, like what the, what the Chinese Communist Party did in China. For example, with uh, you know the World Buddha, so China Buddha Association, oh the state backed and the, and religions, the, yeah, and the the various state backed religions, one that ones that maintain the semblance of moral order but serve the interests of the party. You see, mm-hmm. um, you want to get into the workers' unions and make them no longer advocate for, you know, basically, you know, in their original sense, protecting the workers against these things. You you can turn them into mini socialist states. You make them into institutions that can infiltrate from outside the economic uh, institutions of a country and turn them into basic, you know, mafias. Uh, if you go into a lot, I mean, it's happening. Look at New York, it's kind of like that. But if you go into Latin, certain Latin American countries, it's even worse, where some of the main power holders and the voices behind socialist revolution are actually the unions. Um, you know, I mean, we could go on and on and on. Um, anyone who wants to I'd, I'd recommend watching uh, Yuri Bezmenov's video on it or reading his book, Love Letter to America, for the real in-depth take on this. But it, it's a very thorough, very well-thought-out system that just touches every single element of society. How successful would you say the Soviet Union was? The Soviet Union was very successful, but they also failed in the Cold War. And, when, and, and there was a lot of opposition to the Communist Revolution. And there were a lot of parts of it that were taking place that people did not recognize as being part of the communist revolution at that time. 
I think partly because a lot of the media was uh, unfortunately defending the elements of, say, cultural subversion, while at the same time... I mean, we, I, I, so if you look back at history, the way a lot of big media wrote about the Soviet Union is very similar to way the way that a lot of big media write about the Chinese Communist Party today. That it's this booming economy, that it's... You know, doing an alternative so model well. to uh, the oppressive U.S. Yeah, capitalism yeah. model, and then and of, and of course a lot of big businesses. Funny is funny enough, claiming to be, you know, claim it's a communist society. A lot of the big businesses are doing business with it, investing, and so on too. It, it, it's it's an exact replica of what's happening today. When you get to the Chinese, so I mean, they they were relatively successful. The issue was after it collapsed, a lot of the things they set in motion took on lives of their own. Move, movements that were started through Soviet front operations did not stop. They became independent movements that I think even the people in them don't even know their own origins. They don't know, they, I, I assume they don't know that they were started as front operations. That explains how POGs got popular. <laughs> there you go. But when you get to the Chinese Communist Party, they've continued all of this, but with a much more polished image, and, and in a way that's, I'd say, much more um, destructive, much more deceiving. They're using different things than the Soviets did. I mean, they're using a lot of the same things. The, one of the big issues was, though, is that the United States and many other countries put down their guard. Mm -hmm. With the Soviet Union, we were opposed to them. We were at, we were at pseudo-war with them in the Cold War. We were struggling against them in terms of this whole, you know, uh, say you know what what the what the global communist revolution was that they were trying to push. They were trying to start these violent revolutions in all the different countries of the world, and the U.S. is trying to stop those violent revolutions. You know, criticize them as you want, and how well we were in stopping those, and whether the methods we used were good or not. But that was that's what was taking place. But the Chinese Communist Party not only did we not really do that, and keep in mind they've been way more successful than than the, the Soviets were. But we even gave them access to the world, you know, world financial institutions. We gave them inst access to the world legal institutions. We trade with them very openly. There, you know, we we gave them access to the World Bank. You know, yeah, it's I, been treated in a way the Soviet Union never was. Yeah, I, I recently found the Senate records, which are available online during the debates uh, over whether to grant uh, permanent most favored nation status to China. Yeah, and it's a fascinating read. To look at yeah. all the argument because I was looking at Biden mm. for reasons that reason story we did so I found like his speech during that whole thing about, during the nineties like, in the in I think it was nineteen ninety nine two thousand something like that and um, he was basically arguing that you know we haven't been able to make China change through our more confrontational you know attitude towards them like we haven't been able to affect China's human rights so what we should do is try something new, which is, you know, grant them trade status, welcome them into the, like, World Trade Organization, all of this stuff. And it, he wasn't the only one. It was just very, very interesting to read all the speeches. Yeah. Like, and so the Chinese Communist Party found a way to spread the global communist revolution while making it, while doing it in a way that people don't recognize as such. But so, you said they're not trying to do that specifically. They they are and they they are and they aren't. They, they're they're spreading the China model of socialism. You know, they, I mean, it it basically has every element of communism and the destructive seed of destroying the religions, traditions, beliefs, and institutions of countries, while while still maintaining the socialist Chinese system. You know. Uh, you you could call it communism, I guess, if they fully destroyed religion, morality, belief, tradition, culture, and, you know, values, institutions, financial institutions. If they if they succeeded in destroying everything, I guess you could call it communism. Right, Com but in com America, they have not succeeded in destroying everything. They haven't, but but they they're trying to. And it, this is when you get into you know, for example, culture warfare, them taking over Hollywood. When you get into uh, the cyber security, uh, cyber warfare stuff, where they're doing this death by a thousand cuts approach to steal U.S. innovation and progress, when you get into the United Front, where they're they're controlling, they, basically the United Front is um, a program where they go through the different 
they, they send individuals to the different Chinatowns, and in Chinatowns you have different branches of, say, fraternal organizations. They call them tongs. Benevolent associations. Yeah, benevolent associations. And these are the pseudo-unofficial governing bodies of Chinese communities. Some have tens of thousands. Some claim to have hundreds of thousands of members, although they tend to inflate their numbers quite a bit. So who knows? Um, but basically, they, when they win the allegiance over, these groups begin representing the interests of the Communist Party and basically become pseudo-governing bodies of these local Chinese overseas provinces that we call Chinatowns, you see. And then they can use those to get into our, um, you know, for example, send students or their own individuals to infiltrate different institutions, different businesses. A lot of times these fraternal organizations sometimes exist as um, industry ones. So, for example, like oil workers' tongs, technology workers' tongs, student tongs, police tongs. Once they begin serving the interests of the Communist Party, they become, let's say, uh, centers for infiltrating uh, different inst- whatever their institution is in the name of the Communist Party. Or when they had the Overseas Chinese Affairs Office, which functioned as a part of that, which I've heard they recently merged the two anyway, so now it's just the United Front, you know, inviting U.S. congressmen to China and giving them propaganda tours, inviting U.S. businessmen to China. And they have programs like the Torch Program, programs like... Uh, you know, China 2025, that direct a lot of this, Project 863, that direct all of this economic theft, uh, infiltrating... A Thousand Lights or something? Or they, they a Thousand break, Talents program. Yeah, a Thousand Talents, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and so, you know, they do this. And then, of course, then, you, that, then and this is even just a tiny part of it, too. When you get into what are the original stated goals of communism, seize the means of production. Look at what they're doing in Latin America, Australia, and Africa. Look what they're doing with the One Belt, One Road. Now, yeah, I mean, look at the, look at what they're doing with American technology because it, when Chinese state actors steal U.S. technology and then give or transfer that technology to Chinese companies that then manufacture the USB sticks and the wind turbines and the solar panels and the car batteries and all these things that we had made here, they've kind of seized our means of production. Well, I don't exactly. know if they've done that so much as we've just given it to them. That, Some that stuff too. they've stolen, Shelley. <laughs> they haven't given everything up. And so, you, I mean, they, they, they've been a lot more aggressive in some countries as well. In the U.S., they've done a pretty, uh, I don't know if I want to call it a good job, pretty <laughs> deviously destructive but successful job. But if you look at um, countries in Latin America, Venezuela, for example, the, the, the Chinese Communist Party basically owns a lot of the, in, in, in the infrastructure they can they can make these deals the corrupt local officials basically sell out their countries in exchange for bribes chinese communist party builds in, builds infrastructure eventually gains control of the infrastructure through these uh, predatory loans a lot of times they'll do it in exchange for local resources who controls the natural resources of that country who controls the financial infrastructures of that country who controls the means of production in that country it's a chinese chinese regime and that's happened all over Asia, Africa, Latin Mauritania. America, Mauritania. Mm-hmm. We just had somebody on who talked about Mauritania specifically. Which is yeah. where Atlantis is located. Interesting. FYI. I've never heard of Mauritania. <laughs> it is in northwestern Africa. Oh, interesting. It's mostly desert. With some ocean. A lot of fish. And Atlantis is there. Oh, interesting. And yeah. possibly a Chinese military port soon. Oh, Yeah. Oh, my God. Well, yeah, it was interesting when you were talking about the Tongs because most Chinese people don't live in Chinatowns anymore. But I can see how that system has been adopted to control local Chinese communities. Well, and and when I say that, I'm not trying to, I don't want to make it sound like I'm saying all the Tongs are bad, nor am I saying that all Chinese people in these communities are part of it. Um, I've actually I've done a lot of presentations on these these institutions, and if you were to ask me, this is this is one of the biggest human rights issues that the Chinese Communist Party is doing in, in foreign countries. There, and if you go to Chinatown in New York, there are people who are afraid of speaking out against the Chinese Communist Party on American soil because of the influence of the United Front. There, mm-hmm. there are people whose families will be threatened if they go out and say support a human rights issue in China because of the United Front. There, there, I mean, I, I've interviewed, I interviewed a woman one time, and she told me that 
she was told that she, they could make her disappear, you know, being threatened by these In groups. the U.S.? In, in the U.S. Jeez. Uh, if you look at what they're doing in Australia, um, actually the discussions on the United Front there are really on the surface. In Canada, they're, they're kind of on the surface. In the U.S., it's a unfortunately not discussed nearly as much as it should be well it's hard because like you said earlier like you'll get accused of racism yeah well i mean i when we were in australia I remember talking to some of those chinese people that we interviewed but they didn't want their faces on camera yeah uh and people talking about get, having their families threatened and yeah. talking about the like different like uh, chinese associations you only need one or two people at first and then they can slowly kind of take over the association. Yeah. And their point was that the first victims are overseas Chinese. Well, and, and they, they regard even second and third generation Chinese as targets. Mm -hmm. And so, you, you know, your grandma could have come from China and your mom was born in the U.S. and you were born in the U.S. and you have no connection to the CCP whatsoever. And the United Front will regard you as part of their system and a target of it. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's why we're all overseas Chinese. Right. Uh -huh. yeah. I'm thinking yeah. of because uh, I grew up in San Francisco and uh, we had a mayor recently uh, named Ed Lee who uh, was supported by the San Francisco Chinatown people and uh, he was uh, like a, I think a third generation Chinese American uh, but he seemed to be under a lot of influence from the communist part of the Chinese community on Chinese National Day he hung a Chinese flag outside of San Francisco City Hall um, you know he showed up at a lot of these um, like pro Beijing events and uh, it seemed like he had been kind of co-opted because he was American full American for generations and yet because he was ethnically Chinese I think maybe he felt some pressure but also uh the Chinese community helped him get elected. Yeah, and they they do that. And in in China in San Francisco Chinatown, they had a woman. They called her the Kingmaker. Can't Rose, remember her name. Actually. Rose Pack. Rose Pack. That's the one. She she died there. I think they're naming a street after her now, or something crazy yeah. like that. She she led uh, San Francisco's uh, the the San Francisco Chinatown started persecuting Falun Gong practitioners in San Francisco who were doing their protests outside the Chinese consulate and stuff. And Rose Pack had actually led this kind of like CCP style criticism of Falun Gong, stopping them from being in parades and stuff. Uh, I'd written about this maybe like 10 years ago. Yeah. Uh, and it was, it was crazy to see like, like the CCP using that level of influence, but in an American city. Yeah. And, and just so people have some basis to understand the, the tongs on because you know, we're probably using words. That, I mean, who's ever heard of a tong before, right? It's it's it's, it's a, tongs. It's a you use them like when you're barbecuing. You grab the steak <laughs> and you flip one. Thanks, yes. Dad. So, so basically, traditional Chinese society you didn't. You typically didn't have government uh, government below the county level. The lowest form of government was a county magistrate, and below that you had a bottom up form of government, which is families, uh, guilds, these types of things, right? The tongs. Um, like community groups. Yeah, basically. And, it, of course, some of them were bad, too. You had the snakeheads and, you know, the, the human traffickers and the drug dealer guys. And especially. The, the, the salt gang. Yeah, the yeah. salt gang. And ah. so when when the Chinese migrated to other countries, they kept the same bottom-up form of government, basically. And so they had the Tong systems. The, the they some, some are totally fine. Some of them are engaged in nothing criminal or wrong or immoral. It can be like a family name Tong, like the Lu family Tong. It can be a hometown association like the Fukien, you know, American Association, which is a real one in New York that's pretty devious. It can be the Shandong Association. It can be one that's based around an occupation, like I mentioned, like an oil worker's Tong or something like that. And basically, these are the unofficial governing, at least traditionally, the unofficial governing bodies of Chinese communities. If you take those over... You take over the unofficial governments of these communities, and you become the power over them. You see, and so the Chinese Communist Party understands that, of course, and so they do that. And then the other part of it too is a lot of the Tongs beneath them have the Chinese Mafia. So the, when you talk about the triads, what are the triads? These are the criminal elements that exist beneath the Tongs and operate out of the Tongs. And the Tongs like to maintain plausible deniability. Oh, how can we? 
govern who enters our facilities? How can we control the people? They they just show up to our events. How you know what do we have to do with them? They just show up, right? And so basically, if you need a favor, you go to the Tong. Uh, my cousin, you know, needs a job in this in this organization. Uh, he's he's trying. He's applying for a job in the police. Can you have your buddy in the police pull some strings and get him in? Yeah, sure. Here's a gift. I'll have my guy put in the good word with the supervisor. Say he's his cousin or something. <laughs> He'll get him in. Uh, my cousin's trying to get a work in this technology company. Oh, we have a member of our tongue in that in that company. Here's a gift. Get him in. But it can also be, hey, my cousin needs to be smuggled into the U.S then the triads step in. Oh yeah, we have a guy who does human trafficking. Oh, I want to get involved in the counterfeit markets. Oh yeah, we have a guy who runs counterfeits. You want to get involved in the drug trade. Oh yeah, here's a guy who does the drug trade. You see? And so that's how the, the Chinese mafia functions out of them. In New York, for example, the Fu Ching Gang, one of the largest transnational organized crime groups in the world, some of the biggest human traffickers in the world, uh, they operate out of the the Fukian American Association. There are public reports on this, and they still operate openly. It's, it's, it's totally insane. Well, I mean, I feel like that was talked about a lot in the 90s. Like, in the mid-90s, there was that hu- human trafficking yeah, bus yeah. that happened in New York. But now you don't really hear a lot of people talking about that. That was the Golden Venture. It was that ship that ran aground. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that was the, the Fukuchin gang. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you had the Chinatown bus wars. <laughs> For bus routes, you had people shooting oh, yeah. up Chinese restaurants with automatic weapons and stuff. Yeah, it was it was crazy. So, so I think you've laid out a pretty bleak picture of how the Chinese Communist Party and the communism in general has been working to undermine and destroy American society. And I think Shelley asked the question earlier: What can be done about this? Um, so, for instance, I know uh, a strategy of the Trump administration has been to go after the money. But uh, is that successful? What what can be done in this situation? So the issue the United States is facing is the same with the Chinese Communist Party. is, is the same when it faced with the Soviet Union. Um, you know, of course, everyone talks about McCarthyism and these types of things. He, he was going after these guys who weren't necessarily violating American law, but who were serving the interests of these different movements. Um, he was maligned and criticized for doing that because these a lot of these people are not violating laws. We're a country of laws, and so if you when you talk when you talk about overt espionage, you're talking about espionage that does not violate the law of your country. Can you prosecute that? Can you do anything to stop that? They are not robbing. Well, some of them don't, but you know for the most part, these guys are not robbing. They're engaging in say narrative warfare. They're 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 push they're pushing foreign narratives. They're they're starting up media companies. This is again I mentioned before the Chinese Communist Party is saying strangle you with your own systems. You believe in free speech? We'll start a media in your country on your own soil using your own financial systems that will criticize you and attack everything you represent. You well, know? it's it's scary because when you say that, I I was talking to someone at the National Press Club in D.C. who basically said that uh, Chinese media have you know their own representatives like. China Global Television Network, they have their, um, it's part of like branched off from CCTV, right? So they have their headquarters about seven blocks from the White House. And it's also very close to the press club. And they have their own reporters in the press club who have some level of influence over like which guest speakers come and speak to the press, um, who becomes a board member in the press club. And like they're not the full influence; they're just one of many media organizations. But they're generally treated like a media organization, and not a propaganda department. Is that what you're saying? Right. Well, here's the question: How could you could you ban? Could the National Press Club ban CGTN reporters from joining? Well, that's difficult, right? Because what is the Chinese Communist Party puts all sorts of restrictions on foreign reporters inside China, and the foreign countries just accept this as like that's how it is but right? if you were to do those things in the u.s you would be violating one of our fundamental principles which is freedom of the press yeah, yeah. So, so, it's it's a, it's a difficult i mean yeah so, how would you even solve this the, the the approach trump is i mean he has an interesting approach and one that i i had not even thought of to be honest you know I, honestly i was pretty hope I, I didn't see a whole lot of hope in stopping it until a few years ago but you know the the approach trump has taken is basically hold them by their own standards so, you know, you, you, you enjoy all these freedoms in our country. If you want to enjoy them, you have to allow us the same freedoms in your country. 
And so suddenly all the things the CCP is doing by exploiting an open system is being done to it. And basically, if you're a regime that has maintained power by controlling all outlets of information, controlling what people can see, con you know, controlling basically all society, you can't open it up to a completely free system because it's going to collapse your. It's going to collapse the regime. What, what do you mean? You're they're holding it to the? Are you talking about the tariffs right now? Like the tariffs. So, so for example, allowing you know allowing U.S. companies into China, allow allow you know getting rid of censorship laws in China, allowing say U.S. media into China without censorship. You know, holding it basically to this same kind of open system standard that it's exploiting on our soil. Whether that will work, who knows? Uh, I mean, it's ironic because, like, that is the kind of thing that ought to have been suggested in the late 90s. Yeah, and, and, well, then, and then, of course, Taiwan's taking another approach. Um, they, ha they have actual programs right now to count, you know, outlaw or counter uh, Chinese front operations and these types of things. So the, the, in, Ch in Taiwan, they're a lot more cognizant of it. They're a lot more aware of what's going on, and so they're actually targeting it directly. I, I think we have a problem in the U.S. where I think a lot of, people in our it's gotten better actually because they, they have peter navarro for example advising the trump administration on this stuff and he he knows this stuff really well the death I, by china guy yeah and I, I know navarro he's a great guy and so he he knows all this stuff but for the most part you're dealing with types of warfare most people have never heard of you're dealing with types of crime that don't violate law you're dealing with methods of warfare that are meant to go to the very edge of what would constitute war by our standards but never cross that line. And so it, it, would, it would mean a real fundamental change in terms of how we view all these things in order to stop it and a real concerted effort that, that basically is holistic because you can't target it on one front and it can't be limited to one front because by design, the way uh, dialectical materialism works, the way these things work, is it will always find an opening. It will change its narrative. If you target it, it changes its narrative. It, it takes on a different form, just like... Uh, like synthetic drugs, for example, if you if you make one form illegal, they just slightly change the molecular structure, and it's a new chemical that has to be designated, and they can keep getting around laws by doing that. the 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 strategy overall works in the same principle. You just slightly change it, and then suddenly it's something that gets around you know whatever you're trying to do against it. Mm -hmm. So, if the Trump administration were to only focus on the trade war issue, like the economic issue. That wouldn't solve the problem. No, they they just they just put their resources into another another part of it. Do you think the administration understands that? Well, I th I think they do, and at the same time, though, I would actually say the trade war is pretty dang effective because CCP is not nearly as stable as it looks on the surface. Um, hit, hitting hitting them in that way that starts hitting the pensions, that starts hitting say social stability inside China that starts making people want to rebel against the regime from the inside. When you start, wait, you know, the Trump administration changed rules, for example, as well on uh, fighting ideological wars. They're starting to recognize this stuff. You know, having wars of narrative when it comes to, funny enough, they use this whole, uh, you know, but let's put it this way, before 2016, nobody knew what disinformation was. Now, probably everyone's heard a million times disinformation and active measures and influence operations and these types of things who knew this before 2016 and so yeah, having you know that, that funny enough allowed the trump administration to begin doing things to counter disinformation to begin doing things to counter wars of narrative and these types of things and so putting out a new message fighting them on those grounds when you start hitting hitting the chinese regime at its softest point which is ideology and which is the financial security of people who actually believe in it only because they believe that, say, maintaining the status quo will give them a happier life than rebelling against the Communist Party. You know, that's when you're risking the collapse of your regime, and as we're seeing now in Hong Kong, I think. So we kind of went down a deep, dark rabbit hole, but through it all, you, you I'm getting from you, you still have hope. I, I don't think the Chinese Communist Party is as stable as it looks. And I, th I think it's just like with the Soviet Union. Very few people saw its collapse coming. I think what we're seeing in Hong Kong right now, for example, is a clear example of that. There is a, there is a war of narrative, whether we recognize it or not. There are people marching down the street waving American flags. They, now, ahead of Trump, basically, the, the Chinese regime 
according to some sources I've had, they basically thought the U.S. model had failed. They thought the new future would be the China model. They thought that the, that the, the world had lost faith in what America is, that the American experiment was deemed too corrupt, too, too you say, uh, you know, something that non-functional, something oppressive, that, that it would not achieve, that it, that it was not sustainable, basically. And so the new model would be the China model, this new model they're trying to push around the world. Trump, whether you like him or not, has um, changed that, if, if not somewhat in, in the United States, than in the eyes of people living in oppressive regimes. And I think we're seeing that in China now. How has he changed that in the eyes of people living in oppressive regimes? Well, l- look at look at the look at the protests taking place in the, in Ch- in Hong Kong right now, where people are holding up pictures of you know Trump memes of him looking at his face photoshopped on Rocky's body. You know. Uh, well, I mean, <laughs> you know? I think I think there's like several things going on there. One is which they're asking the U.S. for help. Well, right. so, and, and so when they're they're fighting against the oppressive communist, you know, Chinese Communist Party system. And they're seeing the idea of what the U.S. represents as being kind of the salvation from that, essentially. And it's, you know, it, whether we like it or not, too, there, there is a battle in this country, even in the United States now, against uh, freedom and socialism, I would say. Not just in the United States, but in most of the world. There's a huge cultural shift where, uh, I would say, belief, traditions, and these things are on the upswing. And so, I mean, whether we like it or not, and then, funny enough, it, 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 arguments that seemed like they were dead for a long time, who was criticizing communism before Trump? You know, it's like, what, what, is, what are you talking about? You know, Cold War type stuff? Me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I mean, now it's front and center. It's like, it's like, you know, New York Times is publishing articles promoting the communist system, like, openly. You have... You have politicians calling for open socialism and full socialism that would that would have never happened before and there the the but the, you're also saying the other side is stronger so like both sides of this are coming out in a more open way now yeah the, the, all the all the gloves are off you know the 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 battle in i'd say in the world right now is between these two ideas of socialism and freedom basically i think that might have to be the topic for the third podcast Shelly, you seem skeptical. No, I was just think, I was just wondering how many people would see it that way, though. Well, that's why we have to do another podcast about that. <laughs> well, the idea of socialism, the, the debate always was, going back to even its origin, is whether free will exists, right? It's, it's always been a battle against free will. Well, you don't have a whole lot of that under extreme socialism, do you? No, and the idea is to strip people of that. Or in front of a bag of potato chips. Yeah. To, to, Jesus. Wh- whether mm. people should be allowed to succeed or fail based on the outcome of their own decisions. Whether whether people should be able to choose what they believe in. Whether people should be able to govern themselves. You know, th- this was always the the idea, that the main the main battle between these things. And of course, I mean, this is more the socialist battle. I think if you get into the communist battle, that's the one for, I'd say belief and culture and tradition whereas uh you know totalitarian government is a whole other ball game the totalitarian regimes existed before social you know before socialism but socialism i think embodies to the full ex- to the fullest extent the idea of government stretching down into the, even the most minute decisions of every individual and how they choose to live their lives to different extents of course that reminds me of china a lot mm-hmm I mean, when you were growing up there, there were still ration coupons. Yeah, but that, uh, it's not so much the ration coupons. It's, it's the thought control. The thought coupons. <laughs> okay, I think that's a sign that this podcast is at an end. So yeah, let let us know in the comments if you'd like us to do yet another podcast with Josh, maybe on that topic of uh, freedom and tradition versus socialism and communism. That might be interesting and horribly offensive to a lot of people. Yeah, or I guess any other of the topics that josh brought up while Five hour the rabbit carl hole. young <laughs> <laughs> carl, uh, carl young was an interesting character <laughs> we're stopping now <laughs> um but yeah Five I'm really... hours on hermetic philosophy no. how do i become a hermetic magician um i actually know a hermetic magician is he a communist no he's a gypsy 
a communist. <laughs> what I think, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> Wise. All right. Uh, yeah, I really am curious what you guys listening uh, think about all this. Let us, like, really, let us know in the comments below. And so, Josh, if people wanted to learn more about you and what you do, where should they go? Uh, you can find my show called Crossroads. We're on YouTube. If you go to the Epic Times homepage, uh, T-H-E-E-P-O-C-H-T-I-M-E-S, scroll down, you'll find links to my show. We also have a podcast for that, on that note, yeah, also called Crossroads. Hmm. Well, Wait, I, do you, is it the same channel? It, it's, uh, I mean, different page, but it's the same content, yeah. Oh, we'll provide some links below. And once again, while you're enjoying all of this interesting and intellectual content, you should enjoy it with some tea. I'm Perf- definitely going to have some more tea. Oh, yeah, we got to make some more. So, yeah, that's how much we like this tea. So you should get some tea yourself at go.pathofcha.com slash unscripted. And today we're drinking... Oh, today we're drinking the fragrant aroma of duck poop. That's kind of how I feel now. <laughs> <laughs> like you have a fragrant aroma of duck poop i don't know it's just like terribly depressing and i have a headache <laughs> hey i'm i'm sticking that, that, to that's that my, that's my hope. specialty <laughs> <laughs> you filled me with hope josh i see there's a way out there we go <laughs> i mean i'm hopeful even if i sound depressing <laughs> great well thank you again for joining us josh yeah oh, real pleasure thanks for having me sure and Thanks for listening. Once again, I'm Chris Chappell. I'm Shelley Dong. And I'm Matt Ganesta. We'll talk to you next time.